Hello everyone, it's me again. It's pretty soon for a new video, but that's just how it is sometimes. I got my hands on some free time, which is pretty rare these days, and I thought why not just use that bit of free time to actually do something productive. But anyway, today we are going to be looking at active learning, especially when it comes to art. I am making this distinction because active learning is not something that is exclusive for learning art or how to draw, because active learning is something you can do with everything. Well, almost everything, but you get the gist. Now, what do I mean with active learning and how is it different from normal learning? For that, let us look at the little piece that I'm drawing in the background. Here are some stages that the drawing went through. All of these stages look fairly different and have their own meaning to them. So let's pretend that this video is not a video about the act of active learning, but a tutorial. One of these speed paintings where there's just some music and there's, well, the speed painting. Nothing else is there. And you're a beginner artist that looks at these speed paintings and tries to learn from them. Chances are you will watch the entire video and then think to yourself, wow, the process was pretty cool and there was some stuff done that you don't really know why it was done, but the entirety of the process is now clear to you and you'd like to try it yourself. That is what I would call normal learning or passive learning. You look at something and then you try to do it yourself. But now let's rewind back to the moment where I showed you these three different stages of the piece that I'm drawing in the background. For ease of use, I won't have you actually rewinding the entire video just to see them, but they'll just be showing up right now. Now, if we approach this with an active learning in mind, these three stages become suddenly much more important than basically the entire video itself. Because let's be honest, if you want to learn something, let's say from me, and you watch a video where I paint something, then you're not going to learn anything by looking at every single brushstroke that I do. I mean, you could copy and paste that one single brushstroke, but would you really have learned something from that? No. The reason why these three stages suddenly become so much more important than they were before is because this is the current technique that I have for sketching. I'm not using it all the time, but I'm using it often. And if you're trying to actively learn, then you should try to spot things like that. Like what is the actual technique behind something? You need to actively ask yourself, why does the thing you want to learn something from do this? Because knowing that something is done is oftentimes not enough. If you look at, let's say, a drawing process for shading and you see that the guy that shades something shades first ambient occlusion, then the falling shadows, the terminator, and then some bounce light. This information will be stored in your brain as just simple facts with no context. Surely you will remember what they or them or whatever did to achieve the end result. However, you will not know why they actually did that. And just as observing your reference when drawing before you actually draw is very important, observing what you want to learn before you actually learn is just as important. And now to answer the question why these three stages exist in my process, so at least you don't have to wrap your brain around that, is very simple. I am a kind of shapey guy. I like to have some kind of silhouette or whatever to look at before I actually draw. Sometimes I do it without, but I'm definitely more comfortable with it. It just gives me a basic feeling of the finished paintings, composition and whatnot all. It only takes five to 10 minutes to just block in some simple shapes that can make up an entire figure. So this is usually the first step that I take when drawing something, especially if there is some kind of perspective involved and there are organic shapes. Now the second stage, this rough sketchy thing, is because when I have this underlying shapey block in of what I want to draw, I have a much easier time to just stick to the proportions and have my mental space free for worrying about features and where to place them. I usually take this step only so far to, in a character, draw in the normal anatomy with mostly no clothes. That way I can worry about my anatomy being correct and everything being placed in the right place. And then the third stage of the line art and oftentimes the final one is the finished line art. For a piece that I will paint over, 
This might be quite some messier line art and for a piece that is actually line art only, that might be super tight and super rendered line art. For the latter, I may even take a step in between the line arts and make a final final one. But in this case, in the third step, and so the second iteration of the line art, I use what lines I have underneath guiding me where I want to place my stuff and oftentimes zoom out to see how it actually looks in the big picture. Additionally, now that I have guidelines for all the anatomy that I need, I can easily draw in the clothing. I don't have to worry about making the anatomy kind of wonky and I just can really focus on laying the clothes along the lines of the anatomy that I have drawn already. With all of that said about guiding lines and adhering to them, you also have to know that sometimes you just make a sketch and then you do the clothing and something looks just really weird, even though the anatomy would be right. And if that is the case, then you just change it. I'm very sure in this piece I've changed something up from one sketch to another and maybe didn't even notice it. But now you see that I could talk about all the things that I have done in these three stages, one time in passive learning for about five seconds and one time in active learning mode for a few minutes, which is another great advantage of actively learning something. At least it is when it comes to drawing, because if you actively learn at drawing or actively learn to draw, you will be noticing that you actually draw less but improve more. However, that is not meant as you will have more time. On the contrary, you will have at least the same amount of time spent at learning to draw, maybe even a little more. However, the result will be vastly different. And I didn't really find any good studies when it comes to drawing or whatever, but to be honest, I only googled for like 10 minutes. So there's that. The act of active learning, at least painting and drawing, is something that I would call even the art school syndrome. Because when you boil it down to the most simple things ever, what does art school do that you cannot do in your spare time learning for yourself? Many people will say they have teachers that give you feedback. They have other students that can help you. They have other resources that will be of some kind of help. And others will just say, well, you go to art school for five years and you come out a professional. But the real reason why art school is kind of effective, at least for most people, is because art school gives you a why. And this word, the why word, is exactly what differentiates active learning from passive learning. If you learn about anatomy, then you will just learn all the muscles and maybe even all the names and the muscle groups and how they look. It's a pure game of memorization. That kind of skill is not really affected by active learning or passive learning. You just memorize it and after all of that time memorizing it, then you'll finally get it at one day or another. But when it comes to things like composition and color theory, in art school you learn why all these colors are so different and why they are perceived in different ways, why a color has some kind of emotion to them and why we as artists use these kind of colors and color combinations to show some kind of emotions or story narrative. The same thing with composition. And the way your brain works is that simply with a fact that the brain needs to store, it's, I would say, stored on a hard drive. Or well, at first it would be stored in your RAM, so your short-term memory, and after that it comes into the hard drive. However, that kind of memory hard drive that you have in your brain is your external 10 terabyte whatever memory. It's purely used to store information and if really needed, you can recall it. What you really want to do is provide a reason why this information should not be stored in there. And that is where our little why word comes in very handy. Because think back, have you ever felt the need to think about how to open your door? Have you ever had the need to think about how to hold a tablespoon and how to accurately place it into your mouth without spilling the soup that's on? Chances are pretty high that this is gonna be a no. That is because all of this information is not stored in that weird hard drive in your brain that stores all this relevant information that you may need or may not, but you want to recall them at some point in time. It is actually stored in a much smaller drive, basically the mainframe of your brain. Now, by the way, you have to understand that this is a pretty simplified analogy of our brain, and I'm no neuroscientist, 
so this dumbed down explanation is bound to make at least some kind of science guy very mad. But my point is, all of this information is stored in the brain in a kind of different way, in a much more connected way. And if you know a little bit about neurons and our brain, then you will know that more connections means more good. So basically, the more connections some kind of memory or fact has, the easier it is to remember and sometimes you don't even have to think about it. So you could say, when you open a door, this kind of movement and this information just has so many connections that your brain basically does it on autopilot. And asking this little why question is tricking our brain into thinking that this is something that will be needed for later and often. Because why else would we ask, why do we need to do that? Why would we need to know why somebody else did it? It basically just discerns it from being a normal fact that can be stored and sometimes recalled. It gives recalling that kind of memory a purpose. And with the lazy way our brain works, it only stores things in its mainframe that actually have purpose or need purpose. So asking a lot of whys and hows while learning something, pausing a video and actually thinking about why something is done the way it is done, what kind of positive effects something can have, what kind of negative effects something can have, and comparing one thing to another all while learning something eventually takes more time than just looking at it and memorizing it, but also yields far greater results when it comes to trying to recall that kind of information. And as a little science experiment, there will be a word on the screen appearing now. I myself will have no idea what kind of word I will have picked because this is going to be future me and I am, well, the now me. And since I have no idea what kind of word I'm going to pick, I'm going to give you a explanation why I picked that word without even knowing it. And the random explanation of the word that you're seeing on screen is because I think I like the color that is usually associated with that word. And that's it. That is all the explanation that you'll get. And I'm very sure that in the next video that I do after that, if I ask you what kind of word was blended in in the last video, you're going to recall it. And part of that is because there is actually a meaning why that word was there, even if the meaning had absolutely nothing to do with the word itself. So there you have it. Now you know how to trick your brain into learn actively. You just have to ask the real questions, the whys and the hows, why something is done, how something is done, and how could you improve it. When it comes to drawing, it's pretty easy to just stick to the techniques and the finer details of, well, the nuanced paintings that are done in these tutorials. Asking yourself, why do they color first and shade later, or vice versa. Always give the information that you want to recall a reason to be recalled. And with that said, I hope you will have a wonderful time practicing this active learning method and improving much faster than anybody else on the planet. Except they've seen this video, of course. But since this is fairly underground, I think you're gonna have a much greater time than basically everybody else. And I wish you happy drawing. Goodbye.